Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Aparuta de Sangamata Satawara Ye Sodawanta Bamunjan to Satang. So, I wish to welcome Venerable uh, Sila Vimala, the head monk of the London Buddhist Vihara, who uh, will spend this week here. I've invited him to. Uh, 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 come here to rest because uh, he's the, living in the middle of London with so many duties and responsibilities that uh, uh, I encouraged him to come here in order to just uh, live quietly without any pressures or demands made on him. And the London Buddhist Bihar, of course, is uh, the, probably the oldest still existing Theravada uh, center in the UK. And so it was established by Anagarika Dhammapala many years ago and, and uh, has, is the kind of the pioneering, uh, Theravadan pioneering uh, influence from the early days. And so I've known when I first came to live in England in 1977, I met uh, Venerable Dr. Satisa, who was very encouraging, very welcoming, and then uh, Dr. Vajranyana. Both have passed away, and now Venerable Sila Vimala is now the, taking on the duties, uh, and of course living in London in a kind of highly busy, stressful population center such as London. So we want to uh, support him and uh, encourage him to come here more often, to, to have a place that he can come away from all the busyness and pressures of, of his life, to live a life here of rest and reflection, feeling at ease. <clears throat> so it's being head of a monastery is uh, just very nature is a lot of its uh, position where there's a lot of pr- pressures and expectations from others and and also uh, the way one holds these positions is can we can create stress uh, for ourselves and then we also are the center and the focus for everyone else's views, opinions, expectations, criticisms, uh, and so forth. So this is, you know, when we reflect on these as uh, Dhamma, it's the way it is, that taking on the, let's say, the position of senior monk here, the abbot, or Jawat of Wat Amravati, it, it has its, uh, Perks, it's a it's good sign, also it's on pleasant side. One thing is it being the focus of attention uh, and uh, the, the kind of projections and expectations of others, uh, as well as it brings up your own karmic tendencies to see yourself in, re- in responsible positions and your attachment to your position or the ideals or views that you hold in regards to su- such a, a title as being a head monk or abbot of a monastery or being a teacher or um, whatever position uh, you might have. And that's where mindfulness is, uh, is the only way we can deal with, with the worldly conditions we're experiencing because uh, you know, we, when we try to manipulate our lives to only get what we want and, and, uh, ex- and continually kind of, um, you know, live a life uh, trying to 
live on our own terms, then of course that's not it either. It's learning how to use what we have in a skillful way, whatever way we are, and in terms of personal abilities or qualities or whatever, how to use them for with this practice of awakening the Dhamma rather than affirming positions, developing uh, uh, this, this sense of a separate, this uh, separate self and one's importance or even one's view about not being important, still the same thing. Whether you think yourself terribly important or not important at all is still self-view. <laughs> <clears throat> so how it is, you know, when one operates from that level of the self, if this is the, the ego or the sakaya ditti, if this is our, our modus operandi, what we come from, then it, then it does, it's, it's, it creates, uh, it's an endless stressful experience being a personality, being somebody, whatever it might be. So in the last time I, last uh, one pra, I gave a talk on the three kilesas that obstruct enlightenment. And of course, mana is the, is the sense of I'm superior or I'm the same as or I'm not as good as. So this is a, just to keep this in mind that however you see yourself, in this in terms of your physical appearance, your your position in the Sangha, whether you're a lay person, male or female, monk or nun, novice, if these are you know, if these become just forms of sakya ditti, then then it uh, is uh, it will always stay in that realm, will always feel suffering and dissatisfaction and and um, and the result of that, of course, is dukkha, and and then we uh, suffer. We live in the in the realm of suffering. <clears throat> so even being a senior monk, the head monk, being a, a respected monk or a famous monk or whatever, that's not the answer. That's still suffering. If it's, if it's grasped, you know, it's not, not the end of suffering. <clears throat> Where in the worldly values, it's all about, you know, like uh, coming from my American background, the, the ultimate uh, expression of success is becoming president of the United States. And, <laughs> and uh, we can see what a terrible position that is. Uh, you know, in the sense of having power and prestige, but also being in the, uh, the focus for all kinds of projections worldwide, internationally. Violent views, opinions, prejudices and that arise in the mind. Where power, when one uh, is in a powerful position or seemingly powerful position, then creates suspicion or or fear. But what we can do is observe, be the observer. And so, uh, like this reference uh, to Bhutto, to Buddha, Bhutang Sarnangachami, is this, that's why we take these refuges uh, in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Because uh, that is a skillful means we have in this tradition to, to really reflect the refuge is a safe place. Uh, and it's always about being here and now, awake, and it's not about finding a place on the planet or some ideal situation where you personally feel safe. But even in the midst of danger, in the midst of battlefield or whatever, the safe place is Bhutang Zernangachami. Now this is a, this is this is a way of reflecting what is what does that mean in a practical way that it's not just some kind of, of um, abstract ideal of, 
of a refuge in, in something called Buddha. You know, it's not that, or to believe that there is a Buddha somewhere to take refuge in. What to me it is, is a, is a reminding to take refuge in the awareness, awake and conscious attention in the moment, to bring attention to the here and now, Pachubanatama, to, to uh, surrender to the present, to be, and that surrendering isn't resigning oneself as a person, it's, it's totally accepting the present moment for what it is, whether it's in the midst of a stressful situation or in a peaceful place, whether you're healthy or sickly or whatever. The conditions are changing and they, they depend on other conditions. So you can't sustain uh, peace from the condition level. <clears throat> you know, so we were looking at all the Christmas cards that came to the monastery while I was away and so many have doves with peace written on them. And uh, so there's this, you know, and I've been involved in peace movements since I was in university. Uh, and uh, so we always want peace. And uh, to this day, it's uh, peace is the, let's have peace, let's be peaceful. But, and then we, we, no matter how much we strive to create peace, it's never quite peaceful enough. Because then the conditioned realm isn't peaceful. Basically, it's about change and birth and death. And this uh, relentless, inexorable changingness of sensual, con uh, sensory consciousness. So we're constantly being influenced in one way or another, so irritated or or impinged on in all kinds of ways through the senses, through the body and the mind. So this this is not about it. This uh, the sense realm is not a, its nature is not peaceful. Its very nature is dukkha. And in this sense of is not this isn't just being pessimistic or, and but it's pointing to this reality that that conditions are, their very nature is unsatisfactory. It, there's no, you can't find any kind of permanent satisfaction, happiness, or peace in the changing conditions of your physical form or the sensory world, planetary life. Just listening to the news today about the, the island paradise of Madeira, has had its terrible floods with mudslides and about 40 people killed just in the past couple of days through uh, torrential rainstorms. And yet, my perception of Madeira is this island paradise in the Atlantic Ocean where you go to find peace and be free from stress, from the stress of pressures of London or, or family life where you go to sit on a white sand beach under palm trees and drink uh, mint juleps or something. <laughs> and so even paradise, island paradise, is uh, subject to, uh, you know, trauma, natural traumas like Haiti uh, in, in the Caribbean. That wretched country is, it seems to have, have uh, you know, just have terrible karma strife and corruption and poverty and misery and, and uh, terrible rulers and whatnot. And yet it's supposed to be a very beautiful place, you know, Caribbean island. But, um, and then the earthquake, where it's up to about 300,000 people were, have been killed or lost in, the, in this uh, dreadful earthquake that happened. So well, these are the warning signs, you know, the, the climate change, all the predictions of, of uh, you know, doom, destruction, death, decay, and so forth are, are haunting the human, human uh, condition. Because the nature of this realm is it's, it's, uh, it's not meant to be a kind of permanent refuge of safety and happiness. 
Now when we open to this, then this, if we just grasp these ideas, then it's quite depressing. We just grasp these perceptions and think it's all this misery and suffering and pain and loss. Then we get depressed by it. But that's not mindfulness and that's not refuge in Buddha. In Bhutang Saranangachami, Bhutang Saranangachami uh, is opening to the deathless. It's through this, what we call gate of mindfulness within this uh, karmic condition that we have to live with for its lifespan in its changing condition. It's through this point of mindfulness in the present moment that we realize the deathless, non-suffering. So non-suffering is ultimate reality. <clears throat> and suffering is, is, uh, is just the nature of this realm that we're experiencing through the physical body and the senses. Now we all know we're going to die, so that, that, uh, then this is very important to reflect on the, this fact that even though, you know, even the most materialistic, unreligious person in, on the planet knows they're going to die, this is fact of life. Uh, except maybe we, we don't want to die, we're very attached to life and death might be a perception that frightens us because it's, we don't know what happens when we die. We have all kinds of stories, uh, you know, about going to heaven, hell, or oblivion, or being reborn. And so we, we can be scared if I've done unwholesome acts in this, in this life, then when death, the moment of death comes, probably scared, frightened, because you know, you've heard stories about people who tell lies and commit murders and steal and so forth going to hell. And uh, <laughs> eternal, you could make it really horrible, like eternal hell, forever suffering, unmitigated, terrible pain forever, is probably the worst possible thing you can think of, you know, of having to spend eternity in hell. And then there's also the desire, you know, to find happiness, permanent happiness in a heavenly realm where everything is pleasant and everybody's nice and everybody's happy forevermore. <clears throat> so this, uh, in like in Vipassana and Satipatthana, these kind of teachings are investigating. They're encouraging investigation to observe the way things really are. The Four Noble Truths and the, uh, all these uh, teachings of the Buddha are about investigating, to not telling you how things should be, but how things really are. And, and then you're, you're investigating from the point of your conscious moment, you know, from this point here where you're, the, the physical posture you're in right now and, the, and uh, observing just the, the pressure of sitting or the, the sense of being relaxed or stressed or whatever through the body, through the posture, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, bringing attention just to the function of breathing of your own body. So that you're establishing awareness around the conditions that are happening at this very moment that are quite obvious, isn't it? The physical body is an obvious thing that we, we have to live with, with our own bodies in whatever posture they happen to be in until they die. And then, then the breathing, the body's breathing, when it stops breathing that means you're dead. Your body's dead anyway. So <clears throat> this breathing and posture is now observed, not, not compared with ideal postures or some form of ideal breathing, but just learning to connect to the present moment through the reality of the physical body as it is in the present and the breathing. Now these are like foundations to establish mindfulness because if we don't, you know, we, we tend not to be aware of our physical body unless it's through vanity, looking in a mirror and seeing how, you know, if we look good or not. 
that's not being aware of your physical body. That's, uh, you know, looking at yourself from ideals of what, you know, of the critical mind. Vanity is, is about criticizing, comparing, uh, you know, with ideals of what physical beauty, what you'd like to look like. And, and then you can become, then you're more aware of the things you see in the mirror that you don't quite like that are not up to the standard of perfect beauty. And then you can feel, <clears throat> you know, you want to do something about it or cover it up or... Well, and so vanity is a form of, of uh, self-view, identity. I am, my, my nature is, what I, is my appearance, physical appearance. Then, uh, and that's suffering. To, to vanity is not a pleasant mental state to cultivate. Because, you know, as we inevitably get older, we might reach a kind of peak of physical beauty at a certain age. But by the time you're 30, it all starts falling off anyway. <laughs> no matter how beautiful you might be. <laughs> and, and that can be tra trauma if, if your whole sense of your value is about looking young and beautiful. But in with awareness in Bhutang Saranga Chami, it's uh, it's about being taking refuge in mindfulness in the Dhamma of the way it is. So it's in, in, in the Buddha knows the way it is, knows Dhamma and Sangha. Those who practice in the right way, Supatipano Ujupatipano. It means practicing, investigating, doing it here and now in the, in the proper way, in the right way. And it's not about me practicing in the right way or there is a right way and, uh, you know, that, that I know and that because uh, meditation practice can also create Sakya Diti. You know, so we, the sense of myself, I, I'm better than you are in terms of practice or whatever is sakya ditti. Or you may be, you might see yourself as not very good meditator. That's sakya ditti. Or the tendency now to say we're all the same. Everybody's exactly the same, uh, and we're all, you know, there's no we we shouldn't discriminate or notice the differences. Uh, everything should be exactly, we're all the same, which is another form of Sakya Ditti. So Sakya Ditti is, is the sense of, the, it's the thinking process that we attach to. The ideas, the values, the principles, the standards, the fears, the expectations that, that we cling to. Uh, and some of them are very high, very uh, altruistic, beautiful. Others are very negative, very critical, uh, not, you know, very low. But notice that the emphasis on Bhutang Sarnangachami is being aware of the nature of conditioned phenomena as Anicca Dukkanata. Because this we can actually witness to in the present, because at this moment, uh, whatever, <clears throat> you know, your posture, your breath, your mood, uh, you know, is in this, it's, you know, when you really awaken, you're observing its changingness. <clears throat> it has no permanency. So awareness is aware of, aware of uh, this realm that we're experiencing through our physical body and through the senses, observing its changingness, being the one observing change rather than the condition changing. When we don't know this, then we take refuge in ideals we might have of how we should be or life should be or whatever, then, then we're caught in, in ideals that, uh, that you know, you'll never, you'll never be able to attain. Ideals are 
you know, are lifeless. They have no, you know, they can, they're beautiful, but they have no feelings. They don't have to experience feelings. Uh, and so we can live, you know, try to live, uh, try to make life an ideal, but we're actually having to live in the realm of feeling. Because this uh, realm, the sense realm, is a feeling realm. It's not an ideal realm. It's not fixed in, the, in its perfect form. It, whatever, no matter how beautiful the form might be, it's changing. So this is, this is what we call reflective. This is bhati bhata, practicing, investigating the way it is. So that, and to really awaken to Dhamma means that it's, uh, that this is, this is, uh, this is the, this is the essence of the, of Buddha's teaching. This is its, its uniqueness in terms of, uh, religion at this time is this emphasis on mindfulness, sati uh, with wisdom, sati and panya. And then the human karma that we have is, 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 you know, we chant this, it's a teaching for gods and humans. So I can't very well identify with the gods, but I certainly can uh, recognize the human karma I experience. And that human karma is that having a physical body like this that's conscious and that has the ability to reflect on the present moment. You know, it's not, it's, it's not a, you know, that has, it has this willingness to, to awaken to the present and recognizing the, the value of this and the opportunity that, that, that we have for realizing Recognizing deathless, the deathless reality. And in the midst of the changing conditions, the, the aging process of one's body and the changing conditions of the society, of the monastery, of the weather, of planetary movements, of praise and blame, health, uh, ill health and whatever, uh, the you know these are this refuge is is what we have at any moment regardless of the the changing conditions we're experiencing. So it is um, when you that's why I I, I do emphasize this this. Uh, Taking these these, these uh, things like Bhutang Saranangachami, the three refuges, and really making them work for you. You know, and we can just chant it like it's part of Theravada ceremony. So they ask for the precept, the three refuges, and the precepts can be just perfunctory ceremonial uh, chanting of some sort. But it uh, it may be you know you can be saying chanting Bhutang Theranam Jachami and thinking about something else. It becomes easy just to become a form of habit. Or to, you know, take the, this is to me taking this, this, uh, this in this tradition, Theravada tradition, Pali tradition, this Bhutang Theranam Jachami. What does it really mean here and now, at this moment? And, uh, you know, so that, it, I take refuge in the Buddha. What does that really mean in a practical way? In a realistic way, not in some sentimental, romantic way, or just, uh, you know, with some kind of seeing Buddha in, in some abstract way. But Buddha is awakened consciousness itself, not some force outside in, in, or some sage that lived in India 2,500 years ago. 
It's about awakened consciousness here and now. And it is words, it's poly language, it's not a living language. <clears throat> but it is, a, it's, it's not meant to be uh, some kind of scientific, uh, you know, to prove it, that there is Buddha in the universe uh, through empirical science or modern attitudes towards science. But it, it's uh, one of the skillful means we have in this tradition, how to use it for mindfulness. How to, how to use the teachings in this tradition for mindfulness, your position in the Sangha, your, uh, you know, whatever it might be, junior, senior, whatever, is how to use it for mindfulness rather than for uh, worldly values or the ego, being attached to it on the ego level of, or the, the uh, Mana level. Because it's mana, if I say I'm, because I'm senior, I'm somehow, you know, I'm attached to being senior monk, then that, that's mana, that's sakya ditti, that's an obstruction. But then senior monk, this is the, this is the convention, so then this being, say, senior monk, what is that, how does that affect consciousness? Taking refuge in Buddha isn't about being senior, it's about being aware here and now, which is available to every one of us, whether you're senior, junior, or lay person, or whatever. So this is, you know, this, uh, then, uh, Sankang Saranangachami. Now, Sangha is, it's not individual, it's not about taking refuge, it's not like a, taking refuge in, in a, in an individual teacher or in anything separative. It's, you know, so, and it's not about, it's not to support the idea of me as a separate being, a separate person. It's supatipano, uh, those who practice in the right way, those who are practicing, putting it into practice. So it's not about, uh, you know, the monastic song is a conventional form, of song to remind remind us of sangha, but just because we're samanas, monks or nuns, doesn't mean we're really sangha. We can be full of our ditti, our sense of mana ditti and views and opinions, and we're kind of a conventional sangha, but not, you know, that's not. It can still be grasped in a, from vanity, from mana and ditti, rather than. Uh, let go of, and then, then we're taking refuge in Sangha, in Supatipano, Ujupatipano, Yaya Patipano, Samiji Patipano. So this word Patipano means practicing or doing it, you know, being mindful, reminding, using everything. You know, like some, some people say Theravada Buddhism is an old-fashioned form that we should update or change in some kind of ancient thing out of India that hasn't quite up to date with modern values and or that you can see it as a kind of dead convention. Well, all conventions are dead. You know, they're, they're just, you know, they're, it's up to us to, to bring them to life, being a Sangha isn't isn't about me in a personal way, but it's being aware, being awake, using the convention we have, putting our you know awareness into this convention to use it for liberation, 
not for personal attainment or personal identity. Or to be, or you know, people criticize it and say they don't like this convention uh, and so that it's, that it's wrong or something wrong with it. Because the critical mind, you can see, you can judge various conventions through various uh, positions, attitudes about right and wrong. <clears throat> but in terms of, of uh, awareness, it, it, the main point of it is awakened, awakening the individual to Dhamma, to reality. And that's, that's its purpose in itself. It, it can be just an empty conventional form, a ceremonial form, an ancient tradition, uh, and, and so forth. And we might see it uh, in comparing it with modern values. Or maybe ancient traditions are the carriers of wisdom. When we try to discard tradition and, and ancient, you know, wisdom teachings and so forth, we, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater oftentimes. Because the conceit is that somehow we're, we're more advanced than they were then. Or humanity has advanced uh, to a higher level than it was in ancient India. And these are the conceits of uh, modern life of uh, we can see, you know, we can think that we're much more advanced, demo more democratic, human rights and, and all this are certainly more advanced than they were probably in ancient India, I don't know, is the thing. But uh, still, the basic human problems of ignorance and suffering are, are just as much present now in modern democratic societies as no doubt they were in, in ancient Indian ones. So this is the dukkha that isn't about governments or, or you know, oppressive social systems or anything like that. It's about it's about dukkha that we all experience, even in the most privileged positions, in the most benevolent of societies. So, in in you know my experience is being uh, you know I feel very uh, personally I've been very fortunate in uh, having and I've, you know being born into a uh, in the states, in a in a very good family, and uh, having so many opportunities, uh, options, uh, and so what to do, live life on my own terms. Uh, and still, even when I, uh, even when I, you know, before I became a monk, living life on my own terms didn't lead to happiness. It had moment, moment, momentary occasions of happiness, but nothing sustainable. And so, uh, you know, the suffering was still very obvious, even in the midst of, of uh, all kinds of uh, good uh, conditions. And so it became apparent to me in my last years as a layperson, I was living in the, uh, you may have told you many times, living in the in Saba, in Borneo, where I lived this idyllic life, you know, in a tropical paradise. And life was just, uh, you know, it was just so much fun and, and freedom and, and uh, beautiful tropical place to live. And, and still, I suffered there, not because of the conditions, but because of the conditioning of the ignorance of conditionality, of the mana, of the ditti, of the dhanha that seemed to be how I experienced life, always through mana, ditti, and dhanha. 
or the, the self-view and desire. Then in uh, going to Thailand, becoming a monk there, you know, living in, uh, in the restrictive uh, forms of uh, Vinaya, uh, as taught in the Thai forest tradition in the northeast Thailand, you know, when Semporna, I was pretty much free and to do, say, whatever I wanted. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, life was a banquet, a kind of ongoing party. But, suffering. Then living within the restriction of Vinaya in Wat Bapong, which wasn't a tropical paradise. And, uh, you know, living within uh, structures and uh, having to conform and obey and live according to prescriptions and of behavior was going against my whole social conditioning from my own cultural background. But also intuitively I recognized the value of this. Uh, and, and so it was actually living in monasteries like Wat Nong Pa Pong, then I began to experience and recognize a freedom, you know, an internal freedom and a peace within myself that I never experienced in uh, my tropical paradise. So now, as you all know, I'm going to retire at, uh, after this uh, Vasa, uh, giving up my duties, uh, and of course, this uh, is a very joyful feeling of of uh, letting go of of this uh, having this position, because you might assume that I really like being in this position. But I mean, I sometimes I like, sometimes I can't stand it, you know, and changes. <clears throat> but it also. Is, uh, uh, is an opportunity to, uh, to let uh, like a, the, the younger monks take on these duties because at my age you really uh, have not the interest to, to be involved in, the, in uh, the duties of a head monk or upachaya or things like this. Uh, also, it's uh, uh, the occasion for this has arisen. It's not through me kind of forcing it or, uh, you know, making it happen because of, of my uh, aversion or wanting to run away. It just seems to have things, conditions have come together in a very positive way where this seems to be the appropriate thing to be doing. I know many uh, feedback people feel very uh, sad about this because, I mean, also I feel a sadness in the sense of leaving Amravati and uh, because it is a place that I uh, really established and uh, I've lived here for 25, 26 years and uh, a place I really like. In fact, I still consider this temple the best place on the whole planet for samadhi. <laughs> this is just my opinion, but <laughs> on the whole planet, I've been all over this planet, including the North Pole. I've been to Chile and the Antipodes. I've been to uh, New Zealand, gone from northern, southern hemispheres, all the continents except Antarctica. I've never been to Antarctica. <laughs> All the paradises uh, around uh, Southeast Asia, Hawaii, and all this. But I still, my personal view, per per the personal opinion, that the best place for sitting in Samadhi is here in this temple. So, uh, I'm just offering that as not, I don't, I don't expect you to agree, but. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, uh, in fact, you know, the morning 
meditations here I find, uh, you know, for myself, this, this incredible stillness, wonderful stillness in this uh, temple. So I'm very pleased with this, this building and um, And yet, you know, one can be all stirred up, as we all know, around all kinds of individual conflicts or fears and suspicions and projections that we tend to create, uh, even in the most, uh, you know, harmonious societies, there's always this ability to suspect or to fear because this realm is uncertain, its nature is changing. And uh, we, we also, you know, tend, we have tendencies towards suspicion, fear, fear of authority, fear of power, uh, of projecting all kinds of qualities onto each other. And so, you know, we're, we have all this kind of psychological jargon we use you know, talking about each other in through psychological terms. And, uh, and then we, we study these, these, the modern psychology and then we can project onto each other different labels or adjectives or mental illnesses or problems. <laughs> but what we can know is that whatever we're thinking at this moment is a condition. Thought is a condition. An attachment to a thought makes us become what we're thinking. So contemplate that. Whatever you think and you attach to, you become that. You know, out of ignorance and attachment, we become what we're feeling, what we're thinking. We become this person, this, this uh, body, this personality, the, this uh, condition, this opinion good, bad, superior, inferior, or the same, egalitarian, we become like that. And that becoming then is always leading toward death, toward cessation. So this is where the, these uh, Dhamma teachings are for uh, investigating. And you know, you can't when you're looking for the deathless through grasping the, the concept. You know, when you grasp the concept of Nibbana or Anatta or the deathless or the unconditioned uh, and then you try to find it, you don't know what you're doing. You, 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 you're grasping another concept and without recognizing that you're becoming somebody who's looking for something uh, that you call the deathless or nibbana, <clears throat> and then the uh, then Bhutang Zernangachami is this is to awaken to that to this looking for the deathless is like this, thinking that the deathless is something I've got to get something I must recognize. And that then is be, you become somebody who's trying to get something you don't have or don't recognize. Where in the sense of refuge of Buddha Dhamma Sangha is you're actually awakened to this. You can see your tendency to, to disparage yourself or to feel that you've got to get something you don't have or what you have you've got to get rid of that you're not good enough because you, you still have bad thoughts or fears or uh, you still get jealous or envious or that you shouldn't be this way or that you should have more, uh, be more full of loving kindness and you shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't have uh, critical negative thoughts about other people and so forth and you, you know, that's what the ideal is you know, the ideal of being a, a Buddhist Samana is to be like a, like this Buddha Rupa, really. You know, perfect. But 
that's not what the Buddha was asking. That it would, if we were just Buddha Rupas, we certainly wouldn't need the Vinaya. The Buddha Rupa here doesn't doesn't need Vinaya. <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't have all the temptations and the karma of uh, these living forms, these human forms. So this is awakening to reality is not criticizing or comparing but recognizing. And then that the development or cultivation or real pamana is is cultivating this way of mindfulness within this within the changing conditions we have to live with till uh, the death of, of these physical bodies. So this winter's retreat, it's now the 21st of February, so we have uh, the remaining week of this month in March and just see this is you know whatever whatever happening for you during this retreat be aware it's like this you know it's not to see your own tendency to want to get something or get rid of something now usually when we talk like this and we think we shouldn't be doing anything but that's another position it's nice that, that mindfulness is, is not about doing it, but recognizing, trusting in awakened attention here and now, and really affirming it so that we, we tend to rest in this state of awareness. It's not some kind of delicate state you have to create, but it's uh, learning to recognize and trust it. And that's what Bhutang Sarnangachami really is. It's a reminder of that. It's a skillful means to remind oneself because it's so easy to forget and get carried away with, with one's own views or opinions or feelings of the moment. So I offer this uh, for recollection. Thank uh-huh.